Well, we're very glad to have everybody back here tonight. Um, I'm going to, uh, I'm not quite sure whether we will finish up next week or the next week, but I think we will at least one of the other. So, of course, you know, there's never end to studying what the Bible has to teach on any topic and thinking about it even after you studied it, because that's all a part of the study. I want to mention what I, I think you may remember last week that I was going to give you a quote. And I couldn't find it. Well, I've got it here tonight. And this goes back to the omnipotence of God. And this is a quote from C.S. Lewis. Lewis, I might mention, back in the teens of the first century and into the 20s, was an atheist, and he was a, a don, as they call him, at Oxford. After he left there many years later, he was at Cambridge, and um, he wrote quite a few books on apologetics and was one of the early writers on apologetics. Um, J.R.R. Tolkien of Hobbit fame is one of the ones, if not the one, who helped convert him to believe in God. Tolkien was a Roman Catholic, but nevertheless, uh, when Lewis was an atheist and there was a effort on his part. They were together a lot in their professorial college duties. But Lewis wrote a number of books pertaining to that. And here's one thing he said that I think you might find interesting on the omnipotence of God. Here's what it is. His omnipotence means power to do all that is intrinsically possible, not to do the intrinsically impossible. You may attribute miracles to him, but not nonsense. This is no limit to his power. If you choose to say, God can give a creature free will, and at the same time, withhold free will from it. You have not succeeded in saying anything about God. Meaningless combinations of words do not suddenly acquire meaning simply because we prefix to them the two other words, God can. It remains true that all things are possible with God. The intrinsic impossibilities are not things, but non-entities. It is no more possible for God than for the weakest of his creatures to carry out both of two mutually exclusive alternatives. Not because his power meets an obstacle. Here's the point made out of all of this. But because nonsense remains nonsense, even when we talk it about God. So when someone says, can God make a square triangle? Can he make a rock too big for him to lift? That's intrinsically impossible. It's nonsense. So God can do anything that's in harmony with his very essence from which his nature flows. And of course, we are studying his uh, attributes which flow from his nature. And that's how we try to come to understand God better. Now, tonight, I want to, as we bring the class down somewhat of a close, this is uh, something you might not think that much about, but it still connects with the essence of God and the nature of God. Remember, his nature flows from his essence. And when we talk about the essence of God, we're talking about what God is. And there's only one divine essence. It doesn't have a beginning or ending, and it has its eternity. Now, I'm going to give you several scriptures on this one, so get ready to write them down. It's simply that God is true. God is true. Here are the scriptures. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 19. 
Isaiah 45, verse 19. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 10. Jeremiah 10, 10. John chapter 17, verse 3. John 17, verse 3. Romans chapter 3, verse 4. Romans chapter 3, verse 4. And the last one, Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. Revelation 19, verse 11. Now, when we affirm that God is true, we are affirming three characteristics of God. First of all, he's real. He is truthful, number two. And he is faithful. He's real, he's truthful, and he's faithful. Now, when we study these under these different attributes, and then, of course, this one, don't just think of it as the one thing about God that is. No, this all fits in with everything we've studied about God. God is true in that he's real or he's uh, genuine. He is what he appears to be. He does not deceive because he's not different from what he is revealed to be. God uh, cannot be dissimilar from exactly what he is. That is, he cannot be untrue to who he is. Now, in contrast to the true God, Let's go back to the days of, of the Old Testament or even the New Testament, for that matter, and even today, but not in the sense in as widespread as it was then, to the idols of the people, to idolatry, the pagan gods and goddesses. They're neither real nor genuine. In other words, they're not, they're not what they appear to be. Their existence is not true existence. Well, they don't exist. They are counterfeit gods. They're not true. But the God who is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has revealed himself in Christ, and then in the words of the Bible, the Christian's God is the true God, the only true God. And I cite again what I've already given you, Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 10, and John chapter 17, verse 3. Okay, so we said God is true, that he's real or genuine. Now we want to emphasize that God is true and that he is truthful, truthful. He speaks the truth. Here's some more verses concerning that God is truthful. Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. First Samuel chapter 15, verse 9. First Samuel 15, 9. And in the New Testament, Titus chapter 1, verse 2. Titus 1, verse 2. Then John chapter 17, verse 17, John 17, 17. You can add to that verse 19, John 17 and 19. John chapter 17, verses 17 and 19. And Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18. Hebrews 6, verse 18. The last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. Two passages, chapter 21, verse 2. Chapter 21, verse 2. And chapter 22, verse 6. Chapter 22, 6. Revelation 21, 2. Chapter 22, 6. So when it comes to lies or any kind of error, they're contrary to God's holiness. Now, we studied about holiness last week. 
He does not communicate error nor falsehood. Not only does he not lie, he cannot lie. He is the absolute truth. He is therefore the source of all truth. And because he is um, absolute truth, he speaks the truth and he reveals the truth. What may we conclude from that? We conclude that his revelation in Jesus Christ and in scripture is reliable. The truthfulness of God in speaking is an important concept in relationship to Jesus Christ. Now, who actually revealed Jesus Christ? Well, God did. Whatever he says, that's whatever Jesus says, and it's true. John 14, verse 6. John chapter 14, verse 6. And 1 John chapter 5, verse 20. 1 John 5, verse 20. So whatever he gives us, whatever his words are, we accept them fully as reliable. And he's not to be questioned. What he, what we are to do when it comes to his words, listen to him. If God does not lie, and if Jesus is God, and both of those are true, of course, then the statements of Jesus must be accepted as truthful. Thus, many affirmations of so-called modern liberal criticism simply dissolve when we accept the words of Jesus, the words of truth. Now, notice this, the words of Jesus, though uttered by him in his work on earth, and then through the Holy Spirit by the inspired writers for the rest of the New Testament, are not dependent upon a cultural environment or social norms or age or whether you're male or female or whatever, rich or poor whatever ethnic background, they are normative. What do I mean by normative? They're for everybody everywhere. Now, you would have, people would have us believe today that truth changes from person to person. No. Not when it comes to God. Also, God's truthfulness is in an, an important concept in relationship to the scriptures, should say the nature of scripture. The scriptures have veracity because of their author. Think about what we've studied about the essence of God, the one God, the nature of God, the attributes of God. The scriptures claim to be the word of God. And if the scriptures are truly the word of God, and if God is truthful, then they must be true because God's the one that speaks the scripture. And of course, God is truthful. So the Bible language, it's claim to authority in one thing, truthfulness. And its truthfulness is dependent upon its author. Now, you've heard this verse quoted most often, but that statement in mind, note it again, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scriptures give me inspiration of God. Also add to that, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 2 Peter 
chapter 2, verse 21. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. Now again, let me emphasize the statements of the Bible are not suggestive. They're not suggestions or cultural, but they're normative. The truth of God is just as important and binding in the same today as it was 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago, or when it was originally delivered as far as the New Testament is concerned. Now, some may think that this is simple reason. And again, for those of you who were in the Sunday morning sermon, I hope you'll remember what we said about truth, that which is false, a lie. And the law of the excluded middle. The thing is, is it true or not true? That's pretty simple reasoning. But if you want to call it simple reasoning, if you think of it as that way, because it's that way, then, well, we just can't accept such a thing in this present day. Well, it doesn't matter if it is simple. If it's biblical, that's the word of God on the matter, and it's true. The goal is not to hold an acceptable position among men, but the biblical position among men, regardless of what anybody says, does, or how they treat us. It's the biblical position that we're interested in because the biblical position is true because God is true, and he cannot lie. Now, this brings up the faithfulness of God. And I'm going to have to give you a number of scriptures here. God is true in that he is faithful. God is true in that he is faithful. Starting in the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. Exodus 34, 6. Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9. Deuteronomy 7, 9. Joshua chapter 23, verse 14. Joshua 23, verse 14. Psalm 24, verse 10. Psalm 24, verse 10. And Psalm 36, verse 5. Psalm 36, 5. Isaiah chapter 25, verse 1. Isaiah 25, 1. Isaiah 38, 18. Isaiah 38, verse 18. Lamentations chapter 3. Verses 22 and 23. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. Into the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 22. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 18 through 22. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 24. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 24. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. 2 Timothy 2, verse 13. 1 Peter. Chapter 4, verse 19. 1 Peter 4, verse 19. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. 1 John 1, 9. And the last one is Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. Revelation 19, verse 11. I suggest to those of you who are seeking to develop lessons or along the line of the faithfulness of God, there's a multiplicity of them, 
in those verses. So the focus of God's faithfulness is upon his dependability uh, and his reliability. And is he's trustworthy. His words are sure. How sure is that surety? As sure as God is. That's been the whole point about this. He keeps his promises. And those promises flow from his character. And they're not dependent on any earth, earthly circumstances, any form or fashion or to any degree. Now, because God is faithful, what he says is going to come to pass, and nobody can stop it. I think a good example is the experience of Abraham and Sarah. Another point here in selecting those two as a good example of this is just how the Old Testament strengthens us in our confidence and trust in the words of the New Testament. Now, you remember that God promised a son, Abraham and Sarah. What's their situation? Well, they're both old, and they're past the age of natural childbearing. But God has spoken. What he said came to pass. So, in their old age, God gave them Isaac. Genesis chapter 21. Verses one through seven. What does that do for me? It demonstrates his faithfulness to what he promises. When God says that one must believe in Christ on the basis of the evidence contained in the scriptures, Romans 10, 17, John 30, 20 and 21. When must, one must repent of his sin. One must confess faith in Christ, Romans 10, 10. In Acts 17, 30, of course, would be repentant. And then be immersed in water by the authority of Christ in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission of forgiveness of sins. Matthew 28, 18, verses following, Acts 2, 38, Romans 6, 3, and 4, and so on. 1 Peter 3, 21. When I know I honestly from the heart have done that, then I know God's true to what he said. He said he will forgive me of my sins against him, and I will be a Christian. The Lord will add me to his church when I do that. So when I see what he promised, which to mankind seemed to be an impossibility to Abraham and Sarah, but he demonstrated his faithfulness to his word and to his promises. Nothing could thwart them. Then God is true. And I know where I stand with God. Same thing is true of anything that pertains to living the Christian life and all obligations in the word of God that we must discharge in our living faithful to him. So as I, I leave this, I'll give you this particular Verse that sums up what we're saying in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 10. Jeremiah 10, verse 10. Which simply says that God is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. So that is what we're going to say. At least it gives you a foundation to study even more about how God is true. And again, those of you who are Wanting to develop lessons, I think there's a lot of material there for you to use. Now, let me move to one, and this may mean we'll get through next week if I can get on through this one. Um, we're going to talk about the wisdom of God, and I'll do the same thing here that I did when we started on God is Truth and give you a list of scriptures that back up We'll proof text it, in other words, that God is wise. God is W-I-S-E, wise. God is wise. Job chapter 9, verse 4. Job 9, verse 4. Chapter 12, verse 13. Chapter 12, 13. 
chapter 36, verse 5. Chapter 36, verse 5. Then we go to the book of Psalms, Psalm 104, and I think it's verse 24, I believe. And if it's not verse 24, read the whole 104th Psalm, Brother Kevin, you say it will do you good. Psalm 104, verse 24. Daniel 2, verse 20. Daniel chapter 2, verse 20. Into the New Testament, Romans chapter 11, verse 33. Romans 11, verse 33. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. Ephesians 3, verse 10. And the last one. For now, it's 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17. 1 Timothy 1, verse 17. This is what Paul was talking about in Romans chapter 16, verse 27, that God alone is wise. Romans 16, 27. So not only is God wise, but God only is wise. So when we affirm that God is wise, it's to characterize God as a God of wisdom. Wisdom is not something he possesses. Now mark this down. Remember what we said about the essence of God, the nature of God coming from it, the attributes derived from his nature. Wisdom is his essence not separate from his essence, and it's not increased by experience and age. It remains constant. He is eternally and infinitely wise. The wisdom of God can be said in this way. Is God acting prudently? It refers to God choosing the proper end and the proper means to the end. So wisdom is the right use by God of his infinite knowledge. And we'll say again, knowledge is the resource wisdom uses. Knowledge is the resource wisdom uses. Now, the infinite possibility is known only to God because he's God. The one he deems right is the one that is actualized. So history is the holy expression of knowledge guided by wisdom. History is the holy, H-O-L-Y, holy expression of knowledge, God able wisdom. This means God makes no mistakes. In wisdom, he created Psalm 104, 24. Psalm 104, verse 24. So in wisdom, he rules, and in wisdom, he will conclude. From Creation to consummation. Every act of God is the right act. So, as Paul wrote in Romans chapter 11, verse 33, Romans eleven thirty-three. 33, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Again, Romans 11, 33. So all of his acts flow from his wisdom. Not only does he do the right thing, but he does them for the right 
reason. Again, remember, he's not a man. And don't think of him as that. There are no arbitrary or capricious aspects of his will and his ways. Our God is worthy of glory because he is the God who alone is wise. That's what Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 1, verse 17. 1 Timothy 1, verse 17. Now, many times in the scripture, wisdom and power are mentioned together. An example of that is found in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 20. Wisdom and might, that would be power, are his. Well, it would be a very tragic, terrible thing to have one without the other. Wisdom without power, think about it, is pitiful. And power without wisdom is nothing less than ruthless. But the perfect union of the two is found only in God. He exercises his power with wisdom. Thus, he's able to bring to pass that which he deems wise. Because it is wise. So wisdom, now watch this, wisdom determines the exercise of omnipotence. Wisdom determines the exercise of omnipotence. Well, is there anything practical about all of this? Well, practical one practical benefit is the confidence that we have as believers in, in Christ, since our beliefs based upon the testimony of the scriptures, the truth, because God is a God of truth, God will answer his prayers, or that is our prayers, and he will answer them in wisdom. So when we pray for something, honestly and sincerely, even when we pray in harmony with the scriptures, because he answers our prayers in wisdom, it may not come, as we think it should. Not our will, but thine be done. Most often, we don't know how we ought to pray. We have a model prayer. Even then, we don't know the specifics and details about what all we should pray. But we are assured that God knows our hearts. He knows what we mean. And so we petition the right one, the Heavenly Father, and yet, many times, we just don't know what to say. And a lot of times, we are selfish in our prayer because we're human beings. James warns about that. He says, you don't get your prayers answered because you're asking for things, so you can just um, consume it upon your lust, which means your human appetites. You're not thinking completely as you ought. So it's great that God will hear us in his wisdom withhold some things we think we need. So maybe at times it's best not to pray, but to wait and to pray for patience or suffering. But the child needs to talk to the father. And the father listens. And the father has promised in his infallible word the truth because he is true that he will answer our prayers. And in praying, we know the all-wise God. As the model prayer says, our Father, who art in heaven, knows, he knows what's best, he does what's best. When we can say nothing but our Father, because we don't know how to form the words to really say what we want, what we desire, God understands. Our trust is in him and in his wisdom, in this case, his omniscience, and his omnipotence. There's another benefit that appears when trouble and trials come upon us. Things we don't deem desirable or acceptable come upon us in life. We try and we do some shun suffering. We don't like being ridiculed. We try to run from it, get away from it. 
and we strive to avoid hardship. But all these things come. And sometimes they keep on coming. Consider Joseph and also Job. And you see how long they suffered. I speak of Joseph, the son of Jacob, down in Egypt, so what happened to him to get there and all that. And James even reaches back in writing in the New Testament, says, you've heard of the patience of Job. Well, patience there means bearing up under the burden and still doing right, though you bear up under it and so forth. Uh, so behind or above all of this is God, who will choose our inheritance for us. Psalm 47, verse 4. Psalm 47, 4. And we would do well to study the value of suffering on developing our characters in the likeness of Christ. That's another subject, although it's attached to this. So God's choice is guided by wisdom, infallible wisdom, for the one who knows all that's the object of knowledge and has all power. So who's to find fault with the only one who's wise? Well, we accept all that come. And it's not because we understand, but because we trust the wise Father in heaven. Now, to question our lot in life is to question God's wisdom. Think about that for a minute. To question our station in life, our situation in life, is to question God's wisdom. It is presumptuously to elevate our wisdom over his wisdom, thinking that we know best. You know, there's a, a real good title for television show 60 years ago when you apply it to God, Father Knows Best. So how arrogant, how prideful is the creature? And yet we're created by him. Are we saying that he didn't know what he was doing when he created us? So how sinful, remembering sin is a transgression of God's law, his truth, and he is the God of truth. And that makes us evil. How sinful and evil for us to question God's wisdom. We're not, mankind's not God and cannot be God. So we're back to hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. So acquiescence by man to the ways of God is the only acceptable option. And you see that in Jesus who did not want to go to the cross and who would. But he said, not my will, but thine be done. Now wisdom, according to Proverbs, is to be highly prized. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7. Proverbs 4, 7. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. Again, Proverbs 4, 7. Now, the essence of wisdom is the fear of God. Proverbs 1, 7. Proverbs 1, 7. And also chapter 9, verse 10. Chapter 9, verse 10. In chapter 15, verse 33, to be wise is to hold in awe the Lord, to reverence him, to honor him, to submit to him, to hear and obey his word. Now, look at our land today and the world in general. Not a very wise place. Wisdom can only be thought of considered, contemplated from the perspective of God with any other reference point yielding improper contemplation. So we begin with God. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. Now, in terms of biblical theism and its wisdom, therefore, Everything must be interpreted. Observations not anchored in revelation. And the God of revelation, 
are erroneous. To increase in wisdom is to think God's thoughts and adopt his perspective. It is man who must adjust his thinking and reasoning. Now, once you become a Christian, back to the process of becoming a Christian, when you choose to do that, then you've launched yourself as a new creature in Christ on this very uh, goal to learn to see things as God sees them, and to submit to his will and everything. So wisdom doesn't begin then with man. Wisdom begins with God. It comes to man from God, communicated through the word of God, James 1, verse 5. James chapter 1, verse 5, and Proverbs 2, verse 6. Proverbs 2, verse 6. And here's what the inspired psalmist says. He says that a good understanding of all those who do his commandments, Psalm 111, verse 10. Psalm 111, verse 10. You might want to tie into that Deuteronomy 4, verses 5 and 6. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. So God imparts wisdom to man through his will, his law, his word, his statutes, his instructions, uh, what should interest us. To know the Bible, is to have the wisdom of God. So it should surprise us that the inspired apostle Paul says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Colossians 3.16. Colossians 3.16. Then again, he writes to the young preacher, Timothy, saying that you've known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation. 2 Timothy 3, 15. 2 Timothy 3, verse 15. So who is a wise man? A wise man is one who is filled with God's truth and seeks to obey all of it. So that's the word of Christ of Colossians 3, 16. The Holy Scriptures in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 15. Now we'll close this one out at about perfect timing. We'll only have one more to do next week, so I think we can finish up the class next week. So to get wisdom, then, is to be blessed, according to Proverbs 3, 13 through 18. Proverbs 3, 13 through 18 is to be blessed by God, God of all wisdom. He is therefore the source of wisdom, and he's the giver of wisdom. And is, it is to be blessed by the wisdom that is received from him. Now listen to Paul writing to Timothy, and this will close out the class, and we'll move to questions after the class is over. Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17. 1 Timothy 1, 17. Now listen to him and view what we said on God being wisdom. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, the honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So we shall cease the class for tonight, and we'll try to terminate the whole thing next week. I think we can do it. I thought we could before we started it, but I wasn't sure. But we'll see what we can do. Thank you for being with us through the class.